1970s, if you listened closely, you could hear the faint rumblings of a communications revolution. In the mid-1970s, in the city of Columbus, Ohio, a fast-growing cable company owned by Warner Communications was working on a bold new set of services it called Cube. Warner's Cube service spawned new concepts like pay-per-view television, a precursor of today's video-on-demand services. Cube also allowed customers to respond instantly to opinion polls and quizzes, and it made it possible to measure exactly what channels and what shows were being viewed. Cube was part technology and part bravado. It was, in the words of Warner Cable's chairman, Gus Hauser, an attempt to transform cable into something much broader than a TV retransmission service. The idea was that you could, if you had the equipment, and it didn't exist, uh, you could sell movies one at a time. Mm -hmm. Again, I hired engineers from other companies, and uh, there was no software. The computer industry did not exist. Microsoft did not exist. Mm -hmm. Cube also represented a breeding ground for creative new concepts in cable programming. Networks that endure today, including MTV and Nickelodeon, were started by Warner's Cube programming team in the 1970s. Nickelodeon had a very brave beginning. It began in Columbus, Ohio, and it was a it was the brainchild of Vivian Horner and Sandy Cavanaugh. They tried video comics, they tried a puppet show called Pinwheel, they had a show called America Goes Bananas. Video Dream Theater was a send-in dream program that we did for Nickelodeon. That was our pilot. It was a cool idea, though, kids sending in their dreams, and we would then animate them into their own dreams. And, you know, it was, it was very brave. In 1978, the cable industry cheered new legislation that allowed cable companies affordable access to string wires on utility poles. And in 1976, the FCC repealed rules that had made it difficult for cable systems to import so-called distant signals, or TV stations that originated elsewhere. That rule change made it possible for a swaggering, boisterous entrepreneur named Ted Turner to transform a tiny Atlanta TV station then known as WTCG, into a national TV network he would come to call WTBS, the cable industry's first superstation. Ted Turner was many things, ambitious, hell-bent, determined, and fearless. But the man who would soon conceive and launch the world's first around-the-clock TV news network, CNN, also was a visionary. And like a handful of other aspiring cable TV programmers of the era, his vision was fueled from above, by something called a communications satellite. Thirty years earlier, the futurist Arthur C. Clarke had published research outlining a plan for a constellation of satellites that would rotate at the same speed as the Earth, making it possible to rain down communication signals around the clock, without interruption, across the world. Now, thanks to technology advancements and FCC authorization, communications satellites were coming to the market, with another Atlanta-based company, Scientific Atlanta, leading the charge. And when I read about the satellite, the communication satellite, I said, hey, wait a minute, this is an antenna 32 or 22,000 miles up in, up in space that can cover the whole North American continent, and we can go point, multi-point to every cable operator in the country, and, and, and if we put compelling enough programming on that satellite and give the industry uh, something that people will be willing to pay for, then we can get cable operators to start in the major metropolitan areas and we can wire the whole country and have a national medium and we'll eventually we'll get to 80 percent penetration then we compete with cbs nbc and abc and make billions the cable industry officially entered the satellite age on september 30th 1975 when the brand new television channel hbo beamed a live telecast of the muhammad ali joe frazier heavyweight boxing championship the signal went from the Philippines to the Vero Beach, Florida cable system owned by UA Columbia Cablevision. As industry executives like Robert Rosencrantz watched the Thrilla in Manila, they knew they were seeing history unfold. Overnight, cable industry became a network. Instead of the uh, terrestrial microwave being the key to adding signals, all of a sudden every system in the country was, was eligible to be interconnected. The economy of it, when you visualize that the cost of the transponder is the same if you're feeding one or a thousand, HBO went from a little regional service 
to a net national network in a matter of uh, six months or a year. For the cable industry, satellite communications would spark a period of intensive growth as dozens of new channels, from C-SPAN to USA Network to CNN to ESPN, made themselves into household brands thanks to affordable satellite distribution. As the 1970s came to a close, a cable industry that had once been derided as a media industry stepchild was gaining prominence and power. Cable was coming into its own.